I'm Chuck Norris, and I approve this game. Between the time when gamers play with miniatures and chainmail, and the rise of the Wizards of the Coast, there was an age of advanced role-playing undreamed of. And onto the Skygax, destined to bear the jeweled crown of TSR upon a troubled brow. It was given to teach us all how to roll for initiative. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's get ready to rumble! Welcome to the Roll for Initiative podcast. This is volume number three, issue number 148. DM Vince sitting alongside DM Matt. Hello, everyone. And DM Nick. I'm back, everybody. Nick is back and fresh from Origins. Oh, I don't know about fresh, but he's <laughs> back. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely, well, maybe he's fresh. Sitting in today as a special guest is Brian Fitzpatrick, also known as Fitz. Fitz, how you doing today? I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Oh, not a problem. And uh, if, you know, if anyone's not familiar with Fitz, well, Fitz, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do and a little bit about your gaming history. All righty. Well, uh, I started out, I've gamed for... Eh, three decades, starting out with D&D way back when in the Dark Ages. And uh, uh, you might know me from Game Night Reviews, which was popular for a while, but that's kind of faded to the background as I've kind of switched over to the publisher role and worked on my Mobius Adventures uh, products. So doing a lot of writing and mostly system neutral stuff and still playing some fourth edition stuff and had a good time yesterday with free RPG day. So uh, We forgive you. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I, I hear that a lot. It's okay. How was the free RPG day? Um, we only I participated with my two daughters yesterday morning, and we played in a Thirteenth Age uh, adventure. And Thirteenth Age huh. is similar to Fourth Edition. It's by the same two of the same guys, Rob Heinsu and another guy whose name is escaping me at the moment. Um, but it's uh, a little more focused on role playing and less on the computer role the computer aspect that. 4E seems to to embody. So um, it was fun. I just thought 13 cool. Age was more closer to Dragon Age. I guess I was wrong with that. Um, no, I, there is some Dragon Age type stuff in there, like the stunts and some other things. So, oh, okay. Um, it is kind of a crossover between 4E and Dragon Age. Hmm. But it was fun. Cool. All right, we'll hear more about this in just a moment. Nick, uh, we're heading over to you now for Stars. Yes, uh, uh, we got a couple of starred reviews, and just to remind everybody to send in your starred reviews, you head on over to iTunes, go to the iTunes store, and type in your search role for initiative, and just kind of take it from there and click on the ratings or review section. <laughs> and it sounds like a safe. Our, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I'm trying to be professional here. <laughs> Unlike you, schmoes. <laughs> Matt, do we have any background music for him while he's doing this uh, whole thing? <laughs> I'll see what I can come up with. Okay. okay. Oh, thanks. Anywho, we have our first five-star review from Verthal73. And Verthal says, nice podcast. I enjoy listening to these gentlemen opine on all things one Although it does not prevent me from occasionally yelling, you're wrong, at my iPod, it does get the gears turning in the old noggin. The newest iteration of the cast seems to have a very good chemistry, and they have moved away, for the most part, from negative comments on games slash gaming that they are not familiar with or do not play. Thanks for the weekly diversion on my way to work. Well, thank you, Verthal73. And a lot of the negative stuff, it's you got to take it with a grain of salt. You know, we're just kind of poking fun. It's mostly tongue in cheek stuff, so don't take it too. I have don't to, take it too serious. I have to say, Nick, unless you're Vince. Any other game out there other than First Edition, I hate automatically. So, oh, and I like I said with that caveat, unless you're Vince. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, um, uh, all right. Yes, Matthew. Yes, Matthew. Yes. Any, any comments? <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, yes. I Actually, he said exactly what I was going to say. When, when we make fun of games, we make fun of them in a loving, caring manner. We're laughing with them, not at them. No, really, we hate Sometimes. them. We actually, <laughs> I'm the only non-politically correct person on the podcast. Everybody else is politically correct. So, Yay! <laughs> Race for us! <laughs> Yay. No, really. Grain of salt, grain of salt. Next. Absolutely. All the time. Our next review is from Dad's Angry. And I believe I've seen him on the uh, forums for Roll for Initiative. Oh, yeah. So, uh, And he's just ready, for, ready to roll for initiative, and it's five stars. And he says, what a great podcast. I've listened to every issue since I found it two months ago, forsaking all of her podcasts I was previously listening to. Wow. <laughs> he just said the heck with the rest of them. The hosts of Roll for Initiative do an excellent job of covering the many aspects of events, Dungeons and Dragons, with, with each of them giving their own point of view on each subject discussed. After 146 46 issues and countless special inserts, you would think that the quality of the show drop, but it doesn't. It's better with every issue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Throughout the issues, hosts have come and gone, but the show has maintained its riveting topics and discussions. I have enjoyed all the present and past hosts. I do miss Jason's by-the-book view and Will's Google-like recall of everything D&D, and that's aptly put, I think. But their chairs have always been filled with other great personalities. My favorite part of the podcast is how it's structured. Each issue is broken up into different segments that give you a variety of content. The best episodes are the ones themed to discuss one aspect of the game, and the segments are then geared to focus on that topic. Roll for Initiative podcast also features great interviews with legendary members of TSR and the gaming community. I have learned a lot from the show. Orcs have pig faces, and some pigs have work faces. Yep. <laughs> Clerics can use edge weapons if you play a Nick's game. Oh. Well, yeah, well, that's an ongoing debate. Nick does a great Christopher Walken and Arnold Schwarzenegger impersonations. Get to the chopper! No! Sorry. No! <laughs> and Crispy's voice can be used to play in place of epic hack syrup for some. Right. You know, poor Crispy, I tell you. <laughs> the only negative thing, and I think this is for you guys here, I could say about the show is the wrestling talk. In all their wrestling discussions covering present day to golden age of the WWF, they never mention the greatest tag team ever, Barry Windham and Mike Rotunda. Right, Rotunda. Rotunda. Yeah. Rotunda. Barry Windham, like Mike Rotunda. Rotunda. Like he's very rotund. Mike Rotunda. The USA okay. Express. Overall, each issue. <laughs> overall, each issue is, is professionally Varsity produced. Club. <laughs> great sound quality. <laughs> Oh, it, oh, there goes our sound quality. I love the show's intro and bumpers between each segment. The language is awful, always lawful good, sometimes bordering lawful evil in my opinion, but perfect for the workplace and sharing with, with kids. Vincent, Nick, Matt, and Chad are all the past hosts. Thank you for producing such a great podcast. Yay. Well, thank you, Dad's Angry. Yay. <laughs> yeah. and, and, that's, and since you put in a- yeah, and since he put in a request about USA Express stock, here's a little tidbit for you. Hulk Hogan's iconic Real American entrance theme was originally written for Mike Rotunda and Barry Windham, the USA Express. That was their entrance oh. music first. Aren't were they the Varsity Club, too? No, the Varsity Club was Dr. Death, Mike Rotunda, Kevin Sullivan in a WCW in like 89, 90. I don't know WCW too well. I didn't watch loser wrestling. I mean, uh, WCW. Yes, he, yes, because because uh. Mike Rotunda was Captain Mike because he was captain of the Varsity Club. However, when they dissolved the Varsity Club, they kept him with the captain moniker, made him captain of a, of a ship. <laughs> yes, I remember that. <laughs> Same. What? But uh, anyway, back to the real thing. The greatest tag team is not that. The greatest tag team world is Money Incorporated because <laughs> the only tag team to hold the tag team belts and never actually defend them and always win. So, but it still includes out. Mike Rotundo. <laughs> yes, it still does. Mike Rotundo. I thought the best tag team uh, setup were always the British Bulldogs. I love the British Bulldogs. They were cool. Yes, that goes back a long way. They, they were cheesy. 
wrestling. I woke up yesterday morning and had to, I couldn't find the remote on the TV, which was left on, and uh, no hold bar was on. Oh. So I had, couldn't tear myself away. I had to watch it again. So I, I was actually, headlights. yeah, I was actually at a WWF house show in 1988. And at this house show, doing an interview was Zeus. So I got to see Zeus live doing promo. Was that, was that one of his three many appearances with the Macho Man? Macho wasn't there. This was like the C-Team squad. Our main event was the Rockers and the Rougeos. <laughs> and the undercard consisted of Hacksaw Jim Duggan versus Andre the Giant. Big John Studd versus Haku. Yes! Uh, it was like total B-Team. And that was my first wrestling show I went ever went Hacksaw to. Hacksaw Jim Duggan is not B-Team. Duggan. Andre the Giant was not B-Team. Well, the funny thing about Zeus was that he never wasn't a wrestler, and he only wrestled because of the movie, and that was it. Right. But people didn't for him. Well, he did later wrestle in WCW in the 1995, and uh, was he the one they gave the absolutely horrible name, They not realizing what it meant? Remember when they had a guy called Ultimate Solution? Yes. The, yes. I Was he the Ultimate Solution, or was that... I, Someone else. I think it might have been him. Because they booked him for like one match. Or is that Jeep? So did, did, we, did we annoy everybody enough with wrestling talk, Matt? Possibly. I, so. I mean, I could always go into more obscure, like 1995 <laughs> WCW like, if we want. <laughs> I've the Twilight Zone. What, what happened? <laughs> this is what this. As we now See, transition we into the <laughs> WWF basic adventure game put out by Wit Publishing in 1993. <laughs> <laughs> the most horrible game in the world. <laughs> you can find it for five bucks on Amazon, yeah. I think. <laughs> yeah. It's great to use for shelf paper. Mm-hmm. Hey. It, and they even <laughs> made miniature pewter figures you could for the game that you could paint yourself. Ooh. Yeah. You have your miniature. I can melt don't... them down and use them as ammo. But you can All have right, your so miniature you doink the do? clown. <laughs> what you gonna do, brother? Let's go on to our next segment. No, Nick, you have a con report to give us. Yeah, like, I do. <laughs> yes, uh, my Origins uh, 2014 report. And let me tell you, it was awesome. Or should I say, it was totally awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, this year at Origins, they did have, as we, as I said previously on other episodes, there's 40th anniversary uh, D&D celebration going on. And I think they might be doing the same thing at Gen Con. And they took some key modules out of the, all the different eras of D&D. So you can play in them. Like Castle Amber, Tomb of Horrors, Sunless Citadel, uh, Crystal Shard, and uh, Ravenloft. Just to name a few. And a Wednesday game. And by the way, just to kind of give a background here. I was already... I flew in... From Las Vegas on the red eye back to Northeast Ohio. And then I had the drive down the Columbus. Oh. Thanks, thanks to my wife for booking the red eye. I had like <laughs> sleep. So I was already prepped to go for origins. Already sleep deprivation, you know, setting in. Why don't you sleep on the So my friend Jeff my friend Jeff no, there was no way I was getting any sleep on this plane. It was it was the flight from hell. <laughs> so I can say. Was there an air marshal on the flight telling everybody to put their hands up or things like that? No, it was worse. There was a cat on the plane. A what? <laughs> yes. There was a kitten that somebody brought on the plane and a little thing. And every few every few minutes you hear this. Meow. 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 I'm like, what the hell is that? Is that somebody's phone ringing? And I'm looking around and... And and then there was this lady that jibber jabbered all about herself for like half the darn flight. I I never heard someone uh, like subconsciously crying out like for vindication in her life than this person. And I was like, and then I did this and blah blah blah. I'm like, shut up! I'm gonna stab you in the eye with this. Other than that, that the flight was great, yeah. and the obligatory child that was crying. You know, but other than that, Nick, this thing called headphones, put them in your ears and go to sleep. I didn't have any. <laughs> so That's... pay the five bucks. 
<laughs> no, that's uh, when you pretend you yeah. have them in and you're the crazy person no one wants to talk to. No, well. Anywho, so I get to Origins, stayed at the uh, Hyatt there, which, by the way, was fantastic. Yeah. Wednesday, we got all checked in. Wednesday game was, da 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 da, two more horrors. Yay. Wonderful. Little bit of a hiccup before the game, though. The original DM, now get this, couldn't show. Why? He forgot that one of his kids' graduation was that weekend. Yeah. Oops. Oops. (laughs) Now, I'm a family man. I have a couple of children of my own. There is no way on God's green earth that my wife would ever forget something like that. Ever. It would be circled in red with arrows pointing at the date on the calendar. Reminded every day. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd still forget. But anyway... (laughs) They found a replacement, no problem, and they double booked the game. So instead of six players, we had thirteen. Oh. Yeah, we had wow. like we had like half a platoon. Oh, which wow. in retrospect is what you need to go through to Mahors. So <laughs> we had four True. people playing characters of either of a plain thief or thief multi class. So we could check doors like if you didn't get it, the other guy would step right on in. It was like redundancy, and it was beautiful. It was awesome. I played a magic user thief, and he was really, really fun to play. Um, so, yeah, played Tomb of Horrors and, and um, actually got to Acerac's tomb itself, which was, like, mind-bogglingly uh, crazy because we, we were very fortunate just taking the, the, the proper route. And as far as I could tell no one was metagaming the thing. So we actually, because once we got to the tomb, we were running out of time. We didn't have the right spells to defeat Acerac anyway. I had one shatter spell. Another person had another. We were maybe going to do 15 points of damage to his skull, and that was it. Other than that, he was going to start stealing, stealing souls. So, you know, there you go. It was still really fun. So crashed out. And then Tuesday, uh, Thursday morning, Call Cthulhu game put on by a Row Cthulhu group, who do a fantastic job, by the way. If you ever in a uh, game run by Row Cthulhu, you are going to have a wonderful time, by far. And um, the one we did was a um, – let's see if I remember the name. It was called Final Approach. We were all astronauts trying to find out what happened to the mission to Mars because the first mission, we were kind of like the rescue team. So they're coming back. They, they apparently blasted off from Mars and they lose transmission. Um, so we link up with them and some, and then the strangeness starts. There's a transmission on their ship. They're talking to each other, but they're talking to each other in some strange mechanical, like electronic language. And then all this started, uh, really all the trouble started with my character, with me opening his mouth and saying, we should record this. That was the wrong thing to do because apparently recording it uh, actually has encrypted nanites in the signal which got beamed from our dish to Earth. <laughs> oh, yeah. These ancient nanites took over uh, their uh, spaceship, and the people, and like chaos ensued, and basically we doomed the Earth, which was really Good fun because that's yeah. Thank you, I thank you. I, <laughs> I, you know, I do my best to doom all of humanity to be taken over by Martian nanites. So. So, yeah, you know, and what we found out later on the background of the story was the, the original Martians created these nanites to help build technology and everything. And But unfortunately, through wars and famine, the Martians had to leave. Some of the nanites were left behind. And over thousands of years, the nanites became self-aware. We came there, woke them, took over, and they beamed two transmissions, one to Earth and one to the Mars world ship that left thousands of years ago, saying, hey, here's a new Mars for you. Let's colonize. 
Oops. <laughs> All starting with my characters saying, let's record this <laughs> because it's science. <laughs> so that that was my uh, Call of Cthulhu role-playing game on Thursday then. Um, but as far as the convention itself, um, it was busy, very busy. like to see all the people there. Uh, I was a little um, disappointed in the uh, the exhibit hall. Um, less retailers, and I think that might have something to do with the new version of D and D being premiered at Gen Con. Mm-hmm. So there was a, there was a there was a little bit less uh, retailers there, yeah. but um, still it was it was good. I mean, I was looking for like. You know, Crazy Igor's, he wasn't there. Yeah, Crazy you know, Igor was, retired uh, the, years ago. Oh, he did? Yeah, he actually retired and uh, so, was selling stuff on eBay for a while. I don't mm, even know if he's okay. still doing that. It well, was there like was a, another retailer that... Uh, the, but there uh, was like another retailer that normally would go there. Like, if you buy one, you get three free oh, or Oh, that's a crazy Chimera thing. Hobbies. There's another convention in Wisconsin this weekend... And that's where they're located, so they went to that. I see. Okay. No. Yeah. It's okay. I got you. So yeah, I was looking for. I wanted to get a copy of uh, Tomb of the Lizard King. I don't know how that one fell under my radar all these years, but now I need to have a copy of it. I well, couldn't. I couldn't find a copy. No one was selling like old uh, RPG stuff there, really. Um, so. But other than that, that was that was really cool. You know, we had the battle tech pods there, and it was very well organized. So you know, it was in the lines moved rather quickly when you needed to uh, get like uh, your passes and all. Uh, unless it so, was Saturday morning. That, Saturday unless morning. it was Saturday morning. Two and hour Saturday wait. morning was utter chaos. Yes. Yeah, and that's pretty typical. That's not, pretty typical not, for Origins. Yeah, it's like I so. I made it up Sunday and just walked around the exhibit hall. And there were quite a few booths oh, okay. that were actually empty that one point actually had people in them earlier. So people were just bailing Sunday from exhibiting, apparently. Huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that's when you usually find your deals anyway on Sunday. Yeah. Maybe late Saturday, too. But a few other games I got to play, I got to pl- play... Um, a game called Trias, Triassic Terror, which is a board game about basically being dinosaurs and having your your group of dinosaurs trying to, uh, you know, in the game situation, try to win as many areas for you know, or for you actually go extinct. You get points, and one with the most, you know, uh, I guess evolution points wins. That was that was kind of a weird hazy game for me because I was still kind of tired. <laughs> and I didn't really catch on until the very end, but it was a very fun game. Um, also got to go over to the Mayfair area and play uh, the Discworld board game, which was really, really fun. Had a blast playing that one. And I don't know if everybody out there is familiar when you play anything with Mayfair games there uh, or and some of the other key uh, sponsors, but particularly Mayfair. Each game you play, you get a ribbon that you put on your um, your uh, convention tag, your convention pass, and and usually they are related to settlers of Catan, right? Yeah. And you could guess which ribbon I had that did the different things that you get at settlers. Which one did I get? Blue. Well, you know, like the different types of uh, resources and settlers. You got wood. They have. I got wood. Yep. So I knew, I knew it. <laughs> yep, it's right here. I'm looking at it. The green. The green ribbon says wood on it. So I walked around with wood for days. Awesome. At the convention. <laughs> mm. Yeah. I, think I, I thought just... that would be. A, I thought that'd be a good pickup line, but I don't know. Yep. Anyway, it's not going that so, direction. I'm not going to. So I, we played the uh, the Discworld board game, which was really fun. If you're a fan of Discworld, you got to get this game. It's just it's crazy fun. And then the last game we played on Thursday was uh, a someone who it's a, they made this game. It's called 
Kaiju Chaos. Kaiju Chaos, where we got to play, I mean, and full dioramas of buildings and cars. You had a Kaiju monster, and it was an all beat down bash. And it was very, very fun. It was such a blast. And we actually, some of them, you had Gigan, Mecha Godzilla. We had two Godzillas. We had a actual Japanese model of Godzilla, and we had the 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 Chinese mock-up, uh, knockoff Godzilla on the board. I played something called Tentakill. Uh, someone played uh, Tiamat. Uh, who else? Some other uh, Shogun warrior creature, and Cthulhu. <laughs> So someone had the minute the 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 model of Cthulhu, and uh, so we could. My my friend Jeff played the Chinese Godzilla knockoff. He says, "I will take all your your debt. <laughs> you will be enslaved to me because I bought all your debt." <laughs> cool. So um, that was really fun, and we answered the, the ultimate question: Who would win in a fight? Godzilla or Cthulhu? Godzilla won. Oh, of course he won. Specifically, specifically uh, the Chinese Godzilla beat down Cthulhu. I mean, literally picked up Cthulhu and beat him against, <laughs> beat him against a six-story building. <laughs> <laughs> so that had no chance. Yes, it was so awesome because we found out in the game you actually do more damage when you pick up other monsters and throw them or use them to use them as a beat stick on somebody else. So, so, so we're like, the hell with my natural abilities. I'm going to pick that guy up. If he's smaller than me, I'm going to beat you with him. <laughs> it was a blast. It really was. So Kaiju Chaos, that was on Thursday, Friday. Oh, my gosh, I'm trying to remember. Oh, Star Wars. Another group that uh, that's there is called Sparks. And I think they go to Gen Con and some other conventions yeah. too. They do Spark Star Wars, and they do the old D six West End games version of Star Wars. Cool. And we played in one of their adventures. I've done it last year, and it's kind of a living campaign campaign too. Because if you have a character from previous years and you keep them, if you the GM can sign off on it, and it's sort of like a living Star Wars thing. You can have your characters go on. So. My friend Jeff and I, we, uh, he had a, uh, I think it was a, uh, mine was a scout, a long race scout I had from the previous year. I forget what his was, but he had a, he has a starship in impound from the Empire. He's got to get 50,000 credits. So we're already planning how we're going to get out of impound and uh, we're going to basically be smugglers. <laughs> Actually, we already started that route. So we're, we, we have plans, plans within plans already for our really cool spaceship. So that was Star Wars. And Sparks did a great job. If you ever hook up with those guys, really fun. They and electrify. then... And they what? Are they electrifying? Yes, electrifying. All, all the way. And um, <laughs> that was on Friday. That one Went to the Knights of the Dinner Table live reading, which was really enjoyable, as always. And uh, Saturday... Gosh, I don't even remember what I did on Saturday... Did you wait, oh. look out the window and look at everybody walking around? And No, no. No, not this year. This year did not get to see the naked bicyclists going by. Thank God for that. <laughs> yeah, that was this week, and George Takai was also a part of the parade. Oh, my. Huh. Yes. Set <laughs> phasers for, 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 for stun, Captain. <laughs> um. Delta Green game, that's what it was. Delta Green, if anybody's not familiar with it, is like, it's originally the Call of Cthulhu rules, basic role playing by Chaosium, but it's like Call of Cthulhu meets X Files. And that's what you have with Delta Green by, uh, oh. uh, and if you can find the stuff by Pagan Publishing, some of the best RPG products around. They do so much work in this stuff, so much detail. They've done their research on on conspiracies and UFOs and the Cthulhu mythos. And they've done a fantastic job. I got all four books by for Delta green on my shelf and they're, they're highly prized by me. They're amazing. They are 
they're amazing. And we got to play in a Delta Green game, and uh, it was it was really wild. I guess there's a was, Delta Green live action role play too. Yes, there is. Because I yes, got the book accident. I don't know accidentally. It was just in a bundle of books I bought from North Texas RPG Con. I got some stuff, and inside there was Cthulhu Live Delta Green. Mm-hmm. I never heard. Yeah, it, yeah, if you ever get a chance, if you like, if you like to play a, like a modern day horror with the mythos. Go with Delta Green, in my opinion. It's a great, it's a great way to play. It's so much fun because it, it takes like every conspiracy theory, wraps it up with a big red bow and say, "Here you go, have fun." So, our, our, uh, we had two different cells, and basically the Delta Green thing is an unofficial conspiracy within the government, and it's different cells alphabetically. And I think we were G, F, and G cells. We came together. We've heard about, we got a, a Delta Green friendly person that got in contact with us. He's a, uh, what was a, uh, like a mortician. Not a mortician, but he was a, he worked at the city morgue. And he found, he got this these bodies that came in. <clears throat> where he did the autopsies and they had all these weird like nodules and pestules black nodules on their on their organs and uh, um, yeah. he did the autopsy report and everything like that and like within 24 to 48 hours of these nodules and stuff everything was gone referring to them everything was gone he, and then when he looked at the bodies again all these weird lesions and stuff disappeared <laughs> like they were ever there and in his reports including his own personal files they were just blank areas like somehow they were mysteriously white clean not whited out but just white clean information I'm like that's a little odd mm. so uh, to say the least so we we thought we do the research and everything we do some investigation we find out that there's this new type of heroin that's on the um, on the street that when you take it uh, makes you a little more how would I say it, Randy? You know what I mean? Randy mm-hmm. trying to keep Savage or? I'm trying to keep it a PG here. Oh. <laughs> but at the same time extremely violent. Ooh. Okay? Yeah. So you get a little, you know, ha ha ha, but you're very, you're very violent about it, and um, yeah, we we track down, you know, a pusher in the Baltimore area and who, where he's getting his drugs from, and then we follow this van, eventually, of all places, out in the country to a carnival. Evil. And I'm thinking, oh my god, great dark evil carnival. Here we go, carny folks. Small hands smell like cabbage. Here we come. <laughs> really? And yeah, and we encounter the creature that they were taking its fluids from and leasing the heroin with. But we blew it up. <laughs> Surprisingly, we all sort of walked or limped away from the whole thing. It got nasty. We actually. At one point, we found some dragons fire uh, shotgun shells. We actually used them to pretty much blow this thing to bits. It's the only thing that could stop it. I mean, it was it was really cool. I mean, the guy who did it did a fantastic job of kind of ramping up the suspense and, and the terror. So, and that was my last game. And overall, you know, had a wonderful time at Origins. Got some really good stuff from vendors. Pretty much all Call of Cthulhu stuff too. Um, I got some uh, couple of adventures by a company called Motifus Entertainment, and they do yeah. adventures called Octoon Cthulhu for all the different, basically, Call of Cthulhu during World War Two. Cool, Chris Birch. Yeah, they do a great yes. job. Yeah, and I got two of the adventures written for the original DRP system for Call of Cthulhu, uh, which is set in July 1939, just 
couple of months before the invasion of Poland and Heroes of the Sea, sea during May 1940, so right around the invasion of France. So uh, that was they did a, they did a the, great. There's a great job of mi- mixing in history. There's some amazing yeah. writing there. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm, I want to get their core books here soon, and I just got the two adventures. But the, you know, who doesn't want to fight a bunch of you know Cthulhu or Narlothotep uh, worshiping Nazis? I mean, come on. <laughs> how much how fun is that <laughs> can we add pirates sure why not as long as they're evil pirates what if they're evil Nazi pirates oh even better okay good actually there's some historical uh, fact to that most of the uh, Kriegsmarine during World War II they uh, they took uh, <laughs> merchant ships they out fitted them with guns and hid, and they they uh, they used them for basically piracy on the high seas. So there were evil yep. ninja Nazis. Well, they took like their a lot of their merchant fleet, outfitted them like I said with weapons and uh, aircraft. Mm-hmm. But when uh, allies would see them, they didn't know that they were anything other but merchant ships, because they hid the weapons. <laughs> only bring their weapons to, uh, on a hiding, they did just such a great engineering job of hiding all the cannons and other guns on the ship that you wouldn't that um, you wouldn't think of it as anything but a merchant vessel. Uh-huh. So yeah. uh, another wolf, ship... Wolf in sheep's clothing. Uh, basically, yeah. yes. And there's a there's mm-hmm. a really good book about that somewhere. But yeah, yeah. Priority Nazis in a way. <laughs> so overall, I would say... It was a fun time at uh, at Origins, you know, at the room. The room was great. Uh, after that kaiju battle, we watched uh, – my friend Jeff had, like, all these Godzilla films. So we watched Godzilla versus Gigan, and I'm calling it, like, a WWE match. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, he picks up the building. Oh, no, we don't expect that from Godzilla. That's not the Godzilla we know. <laughs> And I actually got a knock on the door from the neighbors. <laughs> Oops. And other than that, it was a good time. So Yay. Origins was fun. And there you have it. Gen Con. And Gen Con, I don't know. Not going? No, I don't think I'll be able to go. To go. Yeah. I just don't have the time nor the finances to do that. I mean, unless we actually know we're going to win the, the, you know, the one of the Ennies for best podcast. Sure, I'll show up for that, but other than that, I won't be able to get there. I'll make time. No. Yeah, I'd love to go, too. Unfortunately, I can't this year. A lot of things. Yeah. yeah. So North Texas RPG Con was good? Yeah, I had a good time. Uh, I got my own little booth area where I was able to sit down with my MacBook and... Um, plug in all my equipment and just grab random people as they were going by or I went to their table and grabbed them. So I got you. Wow. Yeah. And no restraining orders or anything? No, not this time. Uh, yeah. Not this restraining time. orders. Shut up. That's good. I unfortunately did not get to speak to Tim Cass because I want to talk to him about the Circus Maximus game he was running because that mm. got really loud at one point. And, uh, <laughs> I want to see how that went, but I did get to speak to Frank Mentor, he was as wonderful as always. Um, Bill, I believe it's Bill Webb from Pace Center Games. Mm-hmm. Um, I got to speak with uh, one of the guys from Castle and Crusades. I, his name escapes me. I'm really sorry about that. But he wasn't the actual person from Castle and Crusades. He was just a representative. Uh, I found out later on, but it didn't matter. He still was full of energy. The guy. So, wow, it made you want to run out and buy Castle and Crusades if you're into that. Yeah, it's a pretty good system. Yeah, it just it's like you know, third edition stripped down. Yeah, just yeah, and that's really cool how they did that. Mm. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention, I saw Tracy and Laura Hickman. No, oh, how are they? Tracy's doing fine. I mentioned that they we should have them both on the show sometime. Uh, yeah, so not gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're like okay. 
Yeah, let's do it. I, I, I've been talking to Tracy for years now, and like every time I say that, it's like, oh, yeah, Laurel, come on. And she never comes on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I shook her hand. I said, you must come on the show. She's like, okay. Wow. All right, we'll make the time. But they had their, their new uh, board game I got to play. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah it looked pretty cool. So, in fact, uh, when he said they sold out there, they only had the one demo model left. So, yeah. very, very cool. So, so uh, there was a couple people at North Texas RPG gone from Ireland, which was I was I was surprised at. Wow, that was their convention to go for. Like their big convention was to come to North Texas RPG Con, which I thought was kind of cool that they picked yeah. that convention of all conventions to go to. That's very cool. Uh, there was wow. a few from England. Uh, they had some really good special guests there, some good artists. Uh-huh. Uh, I got to sit down with uh, Eric Tanker from Tanker's Tavern, spoke to him a little bit about things, what he's doing. Nice to finally meet the person that I had an argument for for many years. Aha. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. As we are friendly now, so no worries. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, you know, one of those things. He's a good guy. Uh, we sat down. We had, we, had, we had a beer together. We had a podcast. Hey. Together. Uh, there you go. I had a couple of drinks, no problem. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Glenn was uh, co-hosting me from Save or Die. He was a co-host on that. Cool. Uh, I did sit in one of DM Glenn's games because he uh, needed a player, so I said okay. I mean, I didn't want to take too much advantage of playing in games because they're on a press pass, so I didn't want uh, uh, Bad Mike to uh, get upset and say, "Hey, you, you're on a press <laughs> pass. You shouldn't be playing in games. You're supposed to be press." So. Yeah, because Jeff D kept trying to get me to get into his Empire of the Petal Throne Tecmo, whatever the heck it's called. Game. Jeff D was running Empire of the Petal Throne. Well, it's coming back apparently. No kidding. Yeah, they're doing a new edition of it. So he was trying to get people to play, and I'm like, I can't play because it's not it's an official game. And he kept saying, No, you can play. And I'm like, No, no, no. no. If, it's a, if it's an open game, like open gaming area, sure, I could play. Wow. Official games? No, no, can't do that. <laughs> no, no, can do. No, I didn't want to take advantage of the generosity of the press pass, so. Wow, that's very kind of you. Yeah, I know. I try to be nice. <laughs> try. Try. Yeah, try. Try. So I'll be back next year with more equipment and more interviews, and hopefully maybe DM Nick will be there. You never can tell, can you? Or we can you rust. You never can tell. Time. I'm actually thinking next year for Origins, I might write, might run a couple of adventures. Do it. You know? Yeah, you know, I talked about it last year, but it's like I never know what the deadline is for them to, 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 to uh, submit stuff. So I'm going to think about it over the summer and you know, see what I would most enjoy running. So Cool. All right. We'll see what happens. Uh, let's see. Oh, one last note. OSR Today is your yes. one-stop publication for going on the web and find out what's going on in the OSR. Finally, we have one place to go to find out everything from... And is Roll for Initiative a part of the OSR today? Oh, yes, we are. All, wonderful. Yes, all the Wild Games Productions podcasts are part of this wonderful news page. It's kind of like your Fox News or CN news page. You go there and everything's there from games to supplements to articles they pulled on every OSR feed they could possibly think of. It's all there for your perusing. Why, that is very informative. Why, thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Our public service announcement. And if you have news or have a rumor or want to share something with the OSR community, you can just contact them by typing in news at osrtoday.com. The website is osrtoday.com. You may find them on the G plus page of OSR today, or that you can just go right to their website and contact them directly. Um, right now, trending on the website are various things, how to get to like, let's see here. Uh, bu- 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 Deluxe tunnels and trolls and data. Yep. We got digital orc convention analysis, mm-hmm. the Wayne foundation, fourth annual charity yep. blowout. The Wayne Foundation is run uh, by Kevin Smith, I found out. Yeah, it's uh, oh. run by, like, Kevin Smith is associated by it, but it's actually a lady, Jamie Walton. And basically, it's all about building a home for 
Uh, basically, uh, trouble girls and combating uh, sex trafficking. Yes. Interesting. Yes, I, I get. I didn't know that was a big thing, but apparently it is. So yeah, the 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 lady that founded Jamie Baldwin actually was uh, being trafficked as that as a minor at one point. So this is like wow. her trying to do some good. If you go to Kevin Smith's Modcast and look for Jamie Walton Wayne Foundation, you'll find an interview where she tells her story. And yeah, it's bad. But, well, there's something for you know something to contribute a good cause to to help. You know, combat this sort of thing. Well, then definitely go to Drive Through RPG. They have a bunch of games in a bundle for twenty bucks yeah. right now. Uh, Here's something that might be of interest to some people: Expeditious Retreat Press looking for Osric Adventure submissions. That could be interesting. Yeah, definitely. So go to your osrtoday.com and uh, support them. And there's your OSR. subscribe. And uh, also uh, drop some money for the Wayne Foundation. It's a good cause. Yeah, absolutely. It's very cool. Oh, oh, sorry today. Love it. And I think that's about it. So we'll head into our segment of tonight. Typical of all the evil creatures in the world. I like to find one with table manners. What are you kidding me? I spent years cultivating the worst table manners on the planet. Table manners. All right, in table manners today, along with our our special special guest Brian Fitz, uh, we're going to have, I guess, like a um, some questions and maybe a little bit of a round table discussion on like adding. I don't know if I want to call it fluff, but detail to your your game, to your dungeon, to your game world. So um, let's uh, head right on into it and see how we can. Uh, have a good discussion on adding detail and in and and fluff to your game. So there were some people that had some questions uh, about they were interested in uh, Fitz's style and method of how he comes up with all the products that he comes up with and what he does he how long does he sit down to do things before he decides what he's going to do what is process basically walk us through your process of say like the doors product that we reviewed earlier on in our show. How you came about doing that? Um, for that, that actually came about. I, I actually uh, participated in the role players. Um, yeah, the brain fart, the gamer lifestyle pro- project uh, that's run by John Four of Role Playing Tips. Uh, I participated in that a few years ago, and uh, as a member of that, you kind of are you stick around and you can participate in later things. So they had a thirty day challenge more or less for coming up with a role-playing product and uh, I had an article that I had written two or three years ago that kind of was the the kickoff and I decided I would try and expand that to be a four or five thousand word uh, product and expand on all of the various pieces and good good stuff there and um, it was kind of an interesting process, kind of taking that uh, original article, which was probably only five or six hundred words, and just blowing it up into a variety of areas. Um, so that was for that one. Um, mostly, I I carry a little notebook with me everywhere I go, and if I have a weird uh, idea for anything, I write it down and. Uh, I'll date it, and sometimes I go back through and go, "Oh, that was a good idea." Yeah, let's let's see if we can expand on that. Some of the little spaces products have have got, come from that particular aspect of it. So, but it doesn't take it doesn't take too long. So you don't sit down, plan things out. You just kind of go on the whim and then let your mind take over. Pretty much. I, I, I am a, a firm believer in outlining and um, mind mapping. So I will just sit down and uh, start sketching stuff out on paper. Yes, I actually use pen and paper, which is kind of rare these days. But that's where I start, and we work from there back to uh, writing th- things up on the computer until I have most of a draft. And then I'll start laying things out in, in design. Uh, and once I have... Most things you know, laid out as clearly as I can get them uh, will edit and, and go from there. And 
most of the time it's just me editing and doing layout and I will get clip art from some of the stock art collections that are up on drive through or um, creative commons or public domain art, depending on where I can find stuff mm -hmm. um, and throw that in. And then I have used an editor um, on a few projects, including uh, the big book of uh, little spaces haunts and the brick by brick. So occasionally it is good to get an outside opinion. So I do try to do that when I can get a chance. So let's go over the mind mapping process. That's when you is, – is your mind mapping process – you put an idea around, circle it, and then have little dashes going across the page to another idea. Is that your mind mapping or do you use a different method? Yeah, no, that, that that's it. That's mind mapping in a nutshell. Pretty much you start with a core idea and um, – draw lines any ideas that come up even even if they're ludicrous you write them down and put a little circle around it and draw a line and um, see if that leads you somewhere else um, that was actually how some of the the better ideas for brick by brick came up especially like the creator and maybe it was a slave that was you know uh, forced to work on it or it was uh, uh, an artisan who was doing his finest work ever, you know, that that kind of thing. Some of those odd thoughts that mm -hmm. only come up when you sh when you shake your head to the left, and then you shake it to the right and hope that things rattle around a little bit before you can write <laughs> them down. So. It's almost like a train of thought sort of thing. Yeah. That that kind of it just kind of grows upon itself, and no matter how bizarre or ludicrous or outlandish, just put it down because you never know where it might lead you then. Well, that's the, that's the hardest part is getting that initial draft down. So if you can get yeah. something written down, you can always change it later. But getting that initial idea or paragraph or even just a, a, a title or, or a sentence can, can sometimes lead to all sorts of entertaining things. And that's kind of the way that my brain is. And you probably kind of saw that on the show when we did the reviews, how we just did those random things and – how it just like immediately sparks something in your imagination. You just kind of ran with it and it, and it came yeah, out. That's... Wow. Just out of those few things, you're like, wow, that's really cool. And if you look at it one way, those, those ideas don't go together at all. And then suddenly that you go, well, what about, and then suddenly they kind of coalesce into some weird story that sort of makes sense. And you're like, I wouldn't have thought of that except for, uh, having these ideas sitting in front of me. So that that's kind yeah. of the, the approach. And that's kind of that old school uh, approach. I love all of the, the tables. The original second edition DMG that had the huge dungeon design uh, process at the back that was all random. Did you guys ever play with that? Yes, I, I actually soloed yeah, in that a lot. <laughs> yeah, I, that's a great way to, to use that too. Uh, and that's kind of the, the aesthetic or the... the core of a lot of the stuff that I do just because I like seeing where the heck it goes and then going well that doesn't make any sense what if I roll again and, and then you know you end up with all sorts of ver uh, various paths that you would have never even figured out uh, before so yeah I think that was sort of the thing that like I think you kind of touch on here some of the randomness and the Ill how illogical the dungeon can be and I think some of that I don't know, I, you, and I think you guys can maybe uh, fill in on this. Is like some of that kind of went by the wayside in the past few years, where you know some of the buzzwords like dungeon, uh, uh, you know, dungeon uh, yeah. ecology, yeah. or dungeon geography, or whatever you want to call it, and they, and they say, well, why are these monsters here? That doesn't make any sense. Well, they should have something like, well, it's a dungeon, folks. Uh, it's not necessarily supposed to make sense right. it, all the time. Yeah, it doesn't have to necessarily always make sense. There needs to be a little bit of an internal logic because – but sometimes having that this makes no sense at all lets the player's mind wander and they start thinking of trying to explain in their own mind why something is there. And sometimes that's even better mm -hmm. just having that mystery there is this doesn't make any sense. And then they – Oh, heck yeah. Keep them guessing. Right. Oh yeah, having those those breaks or those those spaces that the the player fills in the blank that that's often I, I am a very um, sandbox player or a sandbox GM mm -hmm. so um, I will throw a bunch into into a pile and say 
okay, what are you going to do? And then follow, follow the PCs. And more often than not, I'm chasing them going, well, that's an interesting path. I didn't have any idea what was going down there, but let's try this. And, and uh, that, that's just my style more than anything else, I think. But I, I like it. It works. Yeah, I, I, and that's one thing I think I might have said in the other shows that I've kind of started going to in a sandbox campaign sort of way. I've just recently gotten into that. I mean, I've taken Castle of the Mad Archmage, used that for my Castle Greyhawk, City of Greyhawk, right there, bloom. Okay, guys, what are you going to do? I'm going to basically let the let the PCs, the player characters' actions dictate how the campaign's going to go. I might yep. put a couple seeds here and there. Other than that, it's pretty open. It's pretty open. So... And I'm having fun with it. I've done a couple of sessions, and I'm really enjoying it that way. So, I like it because it challenges my creativity as much as the PCs, as much as the players. So, it's more of that interactive storytelling as opposed mm-hmm. to walking walking through a module step by step. Right. It makes it the process mm-hmm. more. And don't get me wrong. I, I love modules. Yeah. Yeah. And don't get get me wrong. I love modules. I like using them. And I think every DM kind of tweaks them out their own way. But it's like I find that, that this uh, a sandbox type environment now. I find it very liberating for me as a DM that I'm not really tied down to worrying about if they're gonna follow a particular plot all the way through. So it's interesting though because it only works for certain groups. Yeah, I don't think mm-hmm. you can do it for there. There's a certain kind of player that if you have um, a, a free thinker, it works great. If you have somebody that must be led by the nose from clue to clue that that's less entertaining yeah and they get the and they get bored really quick and they're like okay what's going to happen now i'm just sitting here you know yeah and there's nothing wrong i mean everybody has a different playing style so i'm not saying that that's wrong a wrong way to play i'm just oh, saying no not at all for, for for having a for having that kind of approach to your to a gm you kind of have to have those more creative players that are willing to kind of go out on a limb and go, oh, well, you could do this. Okay, let's go there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what's something you're working on right now that you could tell us about, Fitz? Um, well, I've been working on another brick by brick, but it hasn't gone very far. Uh, I am working on another um, big book of little spaces that's focused more on social situations. So mm-hmm. More on taverns and bars and entertainers and um, all of the little threads that you can throw out there. Like um, one of the things that I had recently was Tavern Trouble, which is uh, one of the examples that I came up with, which I would have never thought of without having some randomness involved, was uh, having a, a bar where everyone was encouraged to carve on the tables so oh. depending on depending on what table you ended up at, you could have a smiley face, or you could end up with, with a, piece, a work of art that had been just worked on over the course of weeks or months or years uh, by a true artisan and, and that tells a story. Um, I thought that was kind of a neat twist to a tavern that that I hadn't seen before. But again, I wouldn't have come up with that on my own without throwing some different ideas together and going, oh, well that's interesting so um so i'm and working on some of those what nick uh, i was saying ahead. that sounds just really cool i can find it just as a dm some huge use out of something like that because from 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 players i'm like oh great another tavern another inn i'm like what's so different about it so i was like with something like that you can really add some detail to it and make each one rather unique so, yeah, exactly. Can, and you don't have to go crazy either. It's it's not it's like adding one detail is often planned to kind of just make mm-hmm. sure that that tavern isn't the same as every other tavern. So, yep. Um, and, and I'm working on another one spot that I already have art for. Um, that's going to be a tent market. Um, mm-hmm. Those are a little different. Those are more like setting pieces that you can drop into your fantasy world as opposed to the brick by brick or, or little spaces kind of supplements. Mm-hmm. Um, and those are, there's typically one or more NPCs 
Eve and a map of the, the of the area and some plot details and um, the most recent one that we had had uh, a few pieces of art in it, including one of the main NPC and uh, some signs that were above the doors and that kind of thing. So I'm having a good time just following my muse at this point. So cool. What made you do system neutral as opposed to focusing on one thing? Um, honestly, when, when I started Mobius Adventures, I started it with a good friend of mine back in the 90s. So it, it's been around for quite a while. And we actually developed our own system, which was kind of a riff on first edition or second edition D&D, uh, Palladium Fantasy, and some other things. And uh, it worked really well uh, back in the 90s when, when Crunch was king and... and um, I was more into rules, and uh, unfortunately, my writing partner passed away in an auto accident, and uh, that kind of fell to the wayside, and I tried getting back into doing systems, and I am not a system guy at all. Um, I failed miserably. The, the Mobius Adventures core rules book um, is available as a pay-what-you-want or get it for free. So if you ever want to see a failed system, um, <laughs> you can download that on Drive Through or RPG Now. Um, it was fun to put together, and it was more of a uh, an homage to my friend that passed away. So, um, but since that particular failure, I wanted to get back into writing, but I wasn't sure how to do it without failing again on the system side. So. Uh, I went with system neutral because I am I'm all about the fluff. I'm all about the creativity and that's always been my my niche that world building and uh backstory kind of ideas. Um so that that's I and I don't really have a favorite system at this point. I've been playing 4th edition. You, you can boo now. Um <laughs> I, I I I've played some uh Dungeon Crawl Classics, which I really like, uh, but you have to have the right group for that because it's so killer. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, I've kind of floated from system to system. I've even tried some Fate uh, and some other stuff, which I really like, but again, you kind of have to have the right group for that. Uh, and our group is pretty much all about the fourth edition, which I'm having a great time, and that's all that gaming is about for me. So as so long as I'm mm-hmm. enjoying myself and playing good characters, that that I, I'm happy. So... Um, I prefer the system neutral stuff so that you can take it and go, oh, that is a great idea. How would I adapt that to uh, Labyrinth Lord or First Edition D&D or Castles and Crusades or, or Hackmaster or whatever, you know, any of a dozen others? Um, leave that to the GMs that know the system inside and out and can stat those things out. Uh, and that way I don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> and that's probably the safest way to do it, you know. You know, and I, I like the um, the system neutral stuff if it's done in a way to where it's not like like how you did it. I thought was, in my opinion, the perfect way. You, you have a lot of good information there about what you're driving at, but mm-hmm. I could still use some dice. I got some charts, some basic stuff. Boom, that's all I need, and yep. that could work with any system, and that. That's a really good way of doing it. And I wouldn't call your other thing a, a failure. It was a learning process, you know? It's like, you oh, learn, it's okay, definitely I learning know process. not to do this, so I'm going to yeah. go with this. <laughs> well, and I have some ideas for some modules, but I, I've been struggling with trying to figure out how to do those in a system neutral way as well. So mm. hopefully in the future, we'll, we'll have a, a, a method of doing that madness. But uh, in the meantime, we'll, we'll stick with doing creativity and, uh, um, system neutral setting kind of supplements. Well, I know that uh, doesn't uh, Nick doesn't isn't Tim Cask and Frank Mentzer their group do system neutral adventures? Yes, they do. I think Eldritch Enterprises. Yes, they do. Yeah, I don't, do they? they you want to take a look yeah. at what they've been doing, just to get a kind of an idea how they're doing it. Maybe you can borrow some ideas from that. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, they did something where it's like they just said, okay. The average human is this number in our scale, and you just take our scale and convert it into the equivalent of whatever game you're playing. 
So they said, in yeah. our world, the average human is a six. Well, we know in AD&D, the average human is a 10, and you just work off those ratios. So there's a little math involved. Mm-hmm. And like the armor yeah. class is done by percentage. Same with to hit. So you just, okay, a 40% chance to hit means I need to roll this on the die to hit. I mean, it's not horribly complicated once you wrap your mind around what they were going for. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So long as you can set the stage and set whatever that medium or neutral is, and then you can go plus or minus from that. Yeah. Right, yeah, that's exactly what they did. So there we go. No one's kept the battle. Nope. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. So is losing, if you ask yeah. G.I. Joe, but that's okay. <laughs> oh, anyway, I got a little... Oh, Never mind. Go ahead. Oh, tell me, Nick. Tell me. I'm, I don't want to rail. I, I don't want to derail this the, this conversation. That's going to derail anyway. I was I was about to derail things, but go ahead. You could start to derail. On. Okay. No, that you said, GI Joe. You know that Kaiju Chaos game? Yes. You could probably do that with almost anything. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, my mind was racing, and I had a few drinks anyway. So <laughs> when I was playing this. I'm like, oh my god, this is this would be great. You could do this with My Little Pony. Oh yeah, jeez. My Little Pony of, of the apocalypse. I think there's also My Little Pony fighting Care Bears. Yep. There's already a game for My Little Pony, I think. Yeah, but you use Kaiju Chaos rules. They're like giant My Little Ponies and Care Bears fighting each other. <laughs> yeah. My Little Pony War, My Care Little Bears Pony Death. Bears. I like it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, but by the way, that artist was there at Origins. The 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 My Little Pony, uh, like the the kind of like the dark ones. Oh, nice. <laughs> My Little Pony. Yes, but I was like, dude, that would be so great. You get like that gives like a whole new thing, like the Care Bear stare and everything, and it's like, <laughs> yes, yes, Nick's becoming a brony. <laughs> no, he is not. But I just think it's hilarious, just trying to think of those things, trying to battle it out in the center of Tokyo or something like that. Call a bear Thulu. Also taking... Call a bear Thulu. Yes. <laughs> or um, taking <laughs> giant Barbies. You could do it with a giant Barbie. It's the attack of the 50-foot woman there. Nice. Yeah. That would work. Derailed. Oh, hell yeah. You just <laughs> I derailed it. Okay. Wow. Yeah, did you see the Call a Cat Thulu booth? Yeah. <sighs> yes, I did. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Have I, you guys yes, played Call of Duty? I have not. Ooh. No, I have not. I've seen it out there. It looks kind of interesting. So anyway, <laughs> did you notice this would derail completely and this idea came into my head since G.I. Joe and it brought me back to Community. Did you see that Community did a G.I. Joe episode, Nick? No. They actually did a throwback and brought all the original voices back and did the original coloring and everything for G.I. Joe. That's- Awesome, and they canceled that funny. show. And they did another oh, advanced there. dragon session. Nice. Oh my god, really? Yeah, but it's... see, I gotta watch it. It stunk though. Mm. That's okay. I liked the first one. The first one was fun. Yeah, <laughs> just, just just with <laughs> with Chevy Chase saying, "I beat Dungeons and Dragons, and it was advanced." <laughs> 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 Or he said, I won it, and it was advanced. Yeah. Oh, my God. So now we've derailed. Yes. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Let's, Let's do... record the transmission. Let's go <laughs> even further. So, Matt, the pay-per-view for wrestling is... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the train is Ooh, plummeting yeah. off the side of the mountain at this point. Yep. Yay. <laughs> Do you have any have any other things you want to share with us, Fitz? No, I'm 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 excited about uh, the stuff that I've done, and I'm looking forward to doing more. And I'm having fun. So if anybody ever has any ideas for new products, give me a shout. I would love to talk to you. And how can they get in contact with you? Uh, the, you can go to MobiusAdventures.com. That's M-O-E-B-I-U-S, Adventures.com, and that'll take you to my blog, which has a contact page. Or you can do Fitz, F-I-T-Z, at MobiusAdventures.com. Yes, or you can do smoke signals, and Fitz will see it. 
Yes. Smoke signals. Yes. I'm also now, on Facebook and, and uh, Google Plus, but there's aren't, there aren't very many people on my Facebook or Google Plus pages. So, but there's links on on, on the uh, blog. So if you're interested in going that direction, I'd love to talk to you there too. Now, before we go, there like the show, the artist studio, <laughs> where they end the conversation with a few poignant questions to the guest. Oh. I have a few for you, Mr. Mr. Fitz. I'm, I'm scared now. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and they are gaming related. Oh, good. If there was any character class to it, would be, what would it be? Oh, uh, probably a wizard. Scary okay. and hiding in the back behind the tanks. I'll actually With your get... one magic missile spell. Exactly. I and should... attack the darkness. <gasps> I should make my one infamous question that I always give every guest. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, Fitz, are you ready? Sure. <laughs> Shoot. If you could be a household appliance, which one would you be and why? Ooh. Wow. Let's keep this PG, Fitz. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I would like to be a blender because I like to mix things up. Oh. All right. Well said. Well played, sir. Well played. <laughs> Very good. So let's head into our last segment of the night. Are you saying that I put an abnormal brain into a seven and a half foot long gorilla? Creature feature theater. And now in the Creature Feature Theater, we have a monster that's quite furry and rather cute. And it's out of the Monster Manual, too. On the page 80, it is the Luck Eater. The what? The Luck Eater. Oh. Yes. The Luck Eater Eater. has the form of a golden furred cat. And. And it can be found anywhere in high lurks and like hidden niches and surprises on a one through four. It, and especially on X Plane. <laughs> yes. It and yeah. it all and when you approach it, it starts purring. And if and all creatures yeah. within Yeah, that was the cat on the plane. <laughs> yes. And all creatures within thirty feet save versus spell or become attracted to the beast. Basically uh-huh. making you a crazy cat lady. The creatures it attracted to it will want to take it with them unharmed and will always permit this to stay with the victims for two to five hours. So you come across this cat. It purrs. You see it. Oh, it's adorable. So you, then you must take the cat with you. You can't resist. Kitty. Yes, it's a kitty. But you see this aura emitted by the cat also causes all within range to suffer a 10% penalty on all saving throws, damage, and two hits. Because it feeds off your luck. <laughs> Failure to save has no effect, nice. but note that all within range must save each round until affected. So you made your save once. If you're still around the cat, you better save again. The luck heater somehow feeds on the luck of the lost, becoming sated only after the indication indicated duration period has elapsed, that two to five hours. If, it, However, it goes without food for any three-turn period. So if you're not making rolls within, like, a three-turn period, the Luck Eater will purr more, causing the benefactors to attack the next creature it encountered. So, yeah, you're just wandering along. Oh, look at this friendly merchant. If you haven't made a die roll in three turns, you're attacking the merchant. And (sighs) if in another three turns you still haven't haven't made a roll, it it causes the benefactors to fight amongst themselves for ten rounds or... Or until a death occurs. So basically, this is a great way to. I don't like this creature. Yes, it's a great way to have fun with a party and cause some internal strife, possibly if they just want to sit there on a long journey and hang out with a cat. <laughs> However, once the uh, battle amongst the party happens, that's when the cat sneaks off unnoticed. Otherwise, the uh, creature will just leave quickly and when sated and purring, so it'll just wander off, allowing the uh, previously attracted to leave. They will. People will also defend this cat if necessary. So if something attacks the cat, you will fight for it. 
So the luck eater. It's the spawning of crazy cat ladies. Wow. Yes. The spawning of crazy ladies. I love it. Yes. The, the, this is one of those like innocuous things. You just put a few of them in a city. And you could have some fun. Maybe maybe the tavern, this one tavern always has bar fights because the owner has a luck eater. <laughs> oh, that's evil i like it that that, that ain't right <laughs> yes <laughs> yes just planning a what just seems an innocuous cat into the background and next thing you know you're in a giant brawl all because of the cat Meow. that'd be an, that'd be an interesting plot for a mystery in a city Yes. Yeah. Tracking tracking down all the weird little fights that are going on all over town. What's what's the common link? Right. It's a cat. Yes, there's this <laughs> one golden cat roaming the city. <laughs> and it must be hunted down. <laughs> and yes, you must find the this one specific stray cat in Waterdeep who's causing chaos. Yes. A D and D animal yeah. control. <laughs> good go to go. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, and the thing is not stupid. It's got low intelligence, so it's it's not animal intelligence. It it knows enough to where if it's probably being hunted down, it'll hide, it'll sneak. Yep. So, right. and it's got four hit die <laughs> too. I'm surprised its alignment's neutral. I would put in parentheses evil, yeah. neutral okay. evil. Or chaotic, at least. Right. Yeah, chaotic neutral, maybe. Chaotic neutral would definitely fit. You know that? Yeah. 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 Oh, I, I could even... you know what? Cats are evil anyway. Yeah. But... <laughs> I, I could even see this being given as, like, a gift to someone you didn't like. <laughs> like yes. Oh. Oh, yes. man. Or maybe another kingdom. To the new mayor of the city. Yes. <laughs> A cat. Yes, here is a cat. Oh, my God. <laughs> yes, they, it's given to the king by another What's his kingdom. Name? Lucky. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, there's all I, kinds. Why yeah. is there an anvil following on the sky? Boom. <laughs> Next thing you know, the royal court's having a brawl. <laughs> it's like it's like parliament in Japan <laughs> or India. I was going to say that, that would oh explain parliament. God. Yes, it would. It explains it Congress, actually. Yeah, it explains so much. There must be a luck eater hiding in there. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And the prime minister just threw up on the president of the United States. <laughs> he failed a saving throw because of the cat in the corner. Yes. Which actually happened. So. Yes, it did back in 1991. Mm-hmm. Yes, it did. <laughs> yes. But yes, the luck eater. It's one of those creatures I bet you probably never used. But you really should. You can have a lot of fun. You and- know, yeah. As a player, uh, in a player standpoint, at least I know my players. They would figure it out. They would. They would like obliterate this thing. It would be a big greasy smear on the on the on the uh, on the ground. Right. But that's all oh, your fault. <laughs> But that's why you put it in an urban environment where there's other stray animals as well. <laughs> and maybe... Yeah, that animal uh, con- animal control becomes an interesting twist then. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. There's, You have a mass cat purge in the city because they know there's one of these loose. <laughs> oh, my God. And then you have all those... Oh, wait a minute. The mages guild would be so ticked off. How many mages have cats as familiars? Right. Or what yeah, if oh, they would have to step in? Yeah, yeah. Or maybe there's an evil one who has a luck eater as his familiar. What if you were in an Egyptian setting? Oh, oh. Uh, an impossible first level quest. <laughs> yes. Oh, you just ticked off the bass. The ticked off bass. Yeah, got us. Good job. Nice. nice. Good job. <laughs> yes. And now you can bust out demigods and deities. Yes. Or deities and demigods. Yes. For that matter. The, the other <laughs> one. The... Yeah, the other one. The, yeah, yours would probably be a better idea. I'm still trying to track down a yeah. copy of the, mine. <laughs> <laughs> That's the dyslexic version. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. Luck Eater. Good stuff. 
And it's one of those non-combat <laughs> creatures that you can make it a whole adventure around because it has no attacks at all. Mm -hmm. So, anyways... If anyone out there has actually used a Luck Eater, please write in. I want stories because they probably are glorious. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah, they, these things must cause lots of chaos. Yes. And I can only imagine if there was a litter running around. <laughs> <laughs> what would a half Luck Eater they do? Breed. Could, they, could they mix breeds? Oh. Could you have a That's half Luck Eater? Yeah. A half Luck Eater. Ooh. Ooh. May Maybe a, a diluted form of luck eater. <laughs> Maybe instead of 10%, it's only 5% and just half all the time periods. But th but then now, you have more of them. What if, he had a, like, what if he had a whole like pack of these? Would the, <sighs> would the effects be cumulative? Oh. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, the oh, uh, the crazy cat lady. All of her cats are the luck eaters. She's just super wow. crazy. If, the, if what if they fed her? <laughs> oh yeah. So she had great luck. <laughs> oh yeah, she channeled <laughs> all the luck they drained. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah. You got a whole plot right there. Right. Just off one luck eater. Next thing you know, you have an entire campaign based around these furry things. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway that's going to end our show for this week Fitz we appreciate you coming on and spending time with us goofing around yes. Hey, thanks for having me I appreciate it absolutely definitely stay in touch with us and uh, I guess I'm going to say keep it original keep it old school again good night everybody good night bye everybody bye all Initiative Podcast is a production of Wild Games Productions in association with d20radio.com. You can visit us at rfipodcast.com or contact us on our forums at osrgaming.org or even by calling us at 570-865-4210. This podcast is produced for entertainment purposes only. All other uses are prohibited. And remember, if your magic missile spell doesn't automatically hit, you're playing the wrong edition. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time on Roll for Initiative. Thank you.